it's good to be back at SOAS again and to see so many of the rising generation of scholars who are going to take forward the important issues about an inequality and exploitation and development in the years to come. So I'm going to talk about what I call economic inequality and gender inequality because I think it's very important at the moment to look at the intersection of different kinds of inequality and particularly uh, to look, I'm going to be looking at um, class and gender inequalities and I'm going to look at some empirical work on the intersections. So, <clears throat> this is the kind of things I want to cover. Um, as you know, economic inequality is now a major concern for both mainstream and heterodox economists, although we might think that some economists are interested in this because they're interested in system stabilization, whereas other economists are interested in this because they're interested in social justice. Gender inequality has always been a major concern to feminist economists and economists from other social science backgrounds, but it's often been seen as a niche issue by mainstream economists and by heterodox economists as well. Uh, I'm glad to say I think there's more awareness now that uh, among economists uh, who are not feminist economists that they need to pay some attention to gender issues. And there is now some empirical analysis which I'm going to discuss of the intersection of gender inequality and economic inequality by economists at the OECD and the IMF. And this suggests that a reduction in gender inequality is associated with lower economic inequality. I'm also going to refer to some as yet unpublished empirical analysis by some heterodox economists which suggests maybe a reduction in gender inequality may be associated with higher economic inequality. So I'm going to try and tease out the different uh, kinds of analysis that these two groups of economists have done and why they've come to the conclusions that they have and some of my criticisms. And then if there's time, I will make a brief reference to Piketty's work because after all he's sold more books on the issue of economic inequality than anybody else, but he ignores gender in discussing what drives economic inequality. I'll say something about what explains these different approaches and findings and also what are the implications for public action. So economic inequality. Mainstream economists focus on the inter-household distribution of income and of wealth. And an example of a recent publication that I'll be referring to is by economists at the OECD, uh, In It Together, Why Less Inequality Benefits All. But heterodox economists have always been uh, interested as well in the functional distribution of income between capital and labor. And that's had a revival recent years and the ILO Global Wage Report in 2013 referred to a lot of recent work by heterodox economists looking at the functional distribution of income. There's also inequality in capabilities emphasized by the human development approach, um, education, health, nutrition, access to public services, etc. Um, and an example of a recent example of that is the UNDP report, Humanity Divided, Confronting Inequality in Developing Countries, which has a chapter on uh, gender inequality, but actually doesn't really look at the intersection of gender inequality and uh, inequality uh, between households or inequality in the income going to capital and labor. And, and I'm also going to be looking at gender inequality in economies. Um, economists recognize the issue of gender gaps in employment, wages, assets, pensions. They don't always recognize the importance of the gender gaps in unpaid work in social reproduction of people and systems. And it's this that feminist economists, I think, have particularly emphasized as something that 
has to be taken into account. Uh, and also that when we're looking at gender discrimination, it's not just a, a formal issue of are there laws uh, against um, treating men and women uh, differently, for instance, who are doing the same work, paying them different wages. There also uh, has to be an attention to the substantive outcomes, not just the laws. And the UN Women Report Progress of the World's Women has a lot of interesting discussion of that. The Human Development Report, as you'll know, uh, regularly focuses on gender gaps in capabilities. And the kind of work that I have done um, particularly looks as well at, as, at economies as gendered structures and argues that gender isn't just a characteristic of individuals, it's a characteristic of economies. Just like economies are class structures, just like economies are racialized structures, economies are gendered structures, and gender is a characteristic of institutions and economic processes. So, um, sorry, I'm doing this the wrong way around. Uh, so I want, I, I want to start off, uh, let me just list the empirical analysis that I'm going to uh, refer to in my talk. I'm going to refer to these two mainstream reports, the OECD uh, in it together, where chapter four has an interesting, although flawed, look at uh, a particular way of looking at the intersection between economic inequality and gender inequality. And I'm going to look at an IMF staff discussion note um, called Catalyst for Change, Empowering Women and Tackling Income Inequality, which has a different um, analytical approach uh, than the OECD one and covers a lot more countries, not just OECD countries. I'm also going to refer to two papers by heterodox economists, a very pioneering paper by Kate Finoff and Arjun Diadev on feminization and the labor share of national income, which was issued as a working paper of the International Working Group on Gender Macroeconomics and International Economics. And sadly, I found that the website that this was on is no longer operative, so it's a bit obscure to actually find it. And then a, a work in progress by Alexander Goshensky and Ursula Manaran at Greenwich. And I'm very grateful to them for sharing with me some of their preliminary uh, results, which I'll uh, say something about. First, let me just um, make sure we all have the picture about gender inequality in the labor market in OECD countries. Uh, the gender gaps in full-time employment and wages have been falling on average in the last 20 years. The employment gap narrowed in all OECD countries over that period, so that by 2013 it was 16% uh, 6 6 on average. But there's a wider gap in working hours because women are more likely to work part-time than men. And if you look at the gender wage gap among full-time employees, uh, on average it, it fell 4 percentage points between 2000 and 2013, but women still earned on average 15% less than men. And occupational segregation has persisted. So men and women are concentrated in different occupations and there's both horizontal occupational segregation and vertical occupational segregation. It's easier to talk about the OECD countries because there's more readily available data on the OECD countries. And I'm aware that most of the OECD countries are high income countries and they're in Europe and North America. Japan, of course, and South Korea are in the OECD, as is Mexico. So we've often got that difficult trade off between uh, wanting to do more comprehensive analysis and thinking where have we got data easily available. And uh, in fact, the studies I'll be referring to, the two by the heterodox economists are OECD countries. The one by the OECD is OECD countries, and it's uh, the one by the World Bank, which has a much wider range of countries, but with a much more problematic uh, um, indicator, I think, that they use of gender inequality. 
But I think we would find a somewhat similar pattern um, in many um, uh, other countries which are not in the OECD of these uh, gender gaps that I've referred to having fallen over the last um, 30 years or so, 20, 30 years, although that fall has come to a halt now in many countries, but at the same, at the same time rises in inequality as measured by uh, things like the Gini coefficient, the uh, measure of the distribution of income between households, or as measured by the shares of labor and capital in national income. And the OECD study asked what impact these falling gender gaps in the labor market had on the inter-household distribution of income as measured by the Gini coefficient. So I wanted to look at the intersection, if you like, between the gender inequality and the class inequality, but taking the distribution between households as measured by the Gini coefficient as one indicator of the um, distribution between classes. Now, with the rise in women's employment rates, women's contribution to household income has risen on average. So um, the average household now, a bigger share of the income comes uh, from uh, women's employment than it did 30 years ago. And the proportion of households with a woman in paid work has risen on average, both for full-time and part-time work. The proportion of households with a woman in higher paying managerial, technical and professional jobs has risen on average as well. So what impact have these things had on the distribution of income between households as measured by the Gini coefficient? What the OECD study said was say, um, let's uh, assume everything else stayed the same and let's compare the Gini coefficient with these increases in women's contribution to household income with what the Gini coefficient would have been had there not been these increases in women's contribution to household income. And they find that the, the um, increased uh, employment of women uh, did serve to reduce the inter-household in inequality be below what it would otherwise have been. It, didn't outweigh the other factors that are driving for greater uh, inequality, but it meant the inequality was less than it otherwise would have been by about uh, two Gini points. But not all of these uh, reductions in gender gaps serve to reduce inter-household inequality. One aspect of it actually served to increase inequality between households. I wonder if you can guess which one. So if we take the overall result, it was if the proportion of households with a woman in paid work had stayed as it was in the mid-1980s, the average Gini coefficient would have risen by an additional 0.8 points. Um, it uh, would have risen um, uh, <coughs> from uh, 28 point to 31.6, but with this increase in women's participation and contribution to household income, it rose to 30.8. But that overall impact um, hides two contrasting uh, uh, impacts from a class perspective. So the the overall impact of the reduction of the um, gender gaps in the labor market is to um, reduce the inequality between household income below what it would otherwise have been. But that's not true. Um, you get the opposite impact from the rise in the proportion of households with women employed in high paying jobs. So there's been a rise in the proportion of households with women in high paying jobs those women tend to be in the same households as men with high paying jobs. And so that tends to push the income inequality higher. But that has been counteracted by the fact that there are a lot of women uh, who are not in high paying jobs 
uh, who've also entered the labor market, and they tend to be in households where the men are also not in high paying jobs. But that extra money that they brought into the household has uh, meant that overall the income distribution is less unequal than it otherwise would have been. So I think that's an interesting study because before 18 this study, I was quite concerned, are we going to find that actually more women in, the, in employment has increased the Gini coefficient, has increased the inequality uh, in income distribution between households. And that would have been the case if the major impact had come from more women in high paying jobs, more women like me. <laughs> Uh, but but uh, in some ways, I was a bit relieved to find out uh, that that impact was outweighed by the fact that lots of women in lower paying jobs, but that makes a big difference to their household income. The method that they've used, as you can see, it's a rather static and mechanical method. It's to say, let's just hold one thing constant. Let's assume nothing else moved. Let's see what the impact uh, would be. If there hadn't been this reduction in gender gaps, what would have been the Gini coefficient? So it doesn't um, consider the determinants of inter-household distribution and the gender gaps in the labour market and ask whether they might be linked. It doesn't explore what might be the causal factors driving uh, what's happening to gender inequality in the labour market and what's happening to inequality in the distribution between households. Well, you look at that data and one hypothesis might be that the entry of more women in the labour market reduced male wages below what they would otherwise be, particularly at lower skilled levels. And there is a long tradition on the left actually of, being, of a worry about more women moving into the labour market lowering men's wages and in the history of the trade union movement there have been moments when trade unions were not terribly keen on having more women in the labor market because they thought it was going to reduce men's wages actually if you if you look at what's where women have moved into the labor market you see on the whole it's not been into the same kind of jobs that men have been doing not the same occupations as men coal mining goes Heavy industry goes, um, and there are new jobs in the service sector that women move into, care industries. There aren't very many men employed in the care industry or as uh, cashiers in supermarkets. Um, and I also think that the rising female employment rates is far from exogenous. It's not suddenly feminism got a grip on the minds of all these women, and they all said, we must have jobs, paid jobs, even if our mothers didn't. Rather, there was a push um, for women to go into the labor market because their male partners were losing their employment. And to maintain the wages needed to, for the social reproduction of a household, you needed two earners rather than one. So there was a push of women into the labor market, this added uh, workers effect. And at the same time, capital was moving in what it produced in the OECD countries out of sectors that employed a lot of men and into sectors that employed a lot of women. And the sectors that employed a lot of men, it was offshoring. So I think there's a more complicated story going on uh, in terms of what's the intersection between the class and the gender uh, dynamics. A further limitation of this OECD study is it pays no attention to unpaid work. It doesn't consider how reductions in gender gaps in the labor market might be associated with an extension of the total working day. If we look at not only paid work, but unpaid work, including for those not of working age, such as grandparents, and I speak now as a, a grandparent who does unpaid <laughs> childcare, uh, and older children looking after younger children. And of course, unpaid work may fall you if you have more money coming into a household because people can afford to buy some labor-saving technology. Uh, there might also be 
improve public provision of care services, development of for-profit care services, and employment of paid domestic workers, often migrant women. But all of those strategies for reducing the amount of unpaid work that needs to be done are much more likely to be available to better off women than to lower income women. And it's the public services that's particularly critical for lower income women. But of course, it's spending on the public services that have been particularly under pressure since the financial crisis. So the positive impact of labor market participation of women on inter-household income inequality may be at the cost of overwork for low income women an increase in their time poverty and their work intensity. So I would argue to really get a, a full picture of the, both the class and the gender dimensions of economic inequality, you need to look at the unpaid work as well as the paid work. Now the IMS staff discussion note is the only one that looks at, it looks at 140 countries, so it has a lot of developing countries in there. And it measures gender uh, inequality by the Human Development Report's Gender Inequality Index, which was created by the Human Development Report in 2010. Uh, but the IMF has uh, done a new estimation using the data that are needed to construct this uh, indicator going back to 1990. So it's quite a long time period now for uh, 140 countries. But I think there's a bit of a problem in using this particular indicator of uh, gender inequality. It, it doesn't have income in it. It's a gap between male and female labor market participation, a gap between secondary and higher education rates for men and women, female shares in parliament, maternal mortality and adolescent fertility rates, all of which are important for getting a picture about gender uh, inequality but um, not income, and not income because of data limitations. You cannot get good data on the gender wage gap for 140 countries going back to 1990. And this um, gender inequality index has been declining in the majority of countries. So what do they do? They, they, their a, a kind of an analytical framework is a, a regression equation that seeks to, quote, explain income inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient uh, by a number of variables, one of which is the gender inequality index. They also look at the shares of the top, the bottom, and the middle income groups, not just the Gini coefficient, which I think is useful because it's much more intuitively clear to people what the shares of the top and the bottom and the middle income groups are uh, than the Gini coefficient. And the other variables they look at are very standard variables when people are trying to, quote, explain um, uh, income inequality, technological progress, trade openness, financial openness and deepening, change for labor market institutions in favor of business, government spending, et cetera, et cetera. And when they did their regression analysis, they found that gender inequality is found to be significantly, statistically significantly related to inter-household inequality. So just to give you one or two of the findings, um, they said they found that if the gender inequality index falls from its highest level in the sample, which was Yemen at 0.7, to the median level, which is Peru at 0.4, then the Gini coefficient falls by 3.4 percentage points, which is similar to the difference in the Gini coefficient between Mali and Switzerland. If the G, uh, gender inequality index uh, rises from the median to the highest level, then the share of the top 10% increases by 5.8 percentage points, similar to the difference between Norway and Greece. And they also looked at the impact of different components of the gender inequality index, and they found for high income countries, the main impact is from the gender gap in labor force participation. And in emerging and low income countries, that's important, but also gaps in education and health are important. Um, some limitations. It's 
not nearly as clear in this study what the transmission mechanism is between the indicator of gender inequality that they're using and the inter-household income inequality either as measured by the Gini coefficient or the uh, share at the top 10%. Um, there's a kind of lot of implicit links between this gender inequality index and what might be happening to income between households, where's a much tighter transmission mechanism between gender inequality in the labour market and the inequality between households in the OECD study. Uh, there's also, as with any regression analysis, the problem of direction of causality. Um, and uh, 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 excluded variables, maybe there are other sets of factors that, inc that help explain both the degree of gender inequality and the degree of inequality uh, between households and their incomes. So uh, I would be inclined to argue that we, we need to take into account the possible joint determination of both the gender inequality and the class inequality by a process of capital accumulation which leads to weakening of restrictions, legal restrictions, for instance, on women entering uh, uh, the labor market. But at the same time, it weakens protections for workers. So yeah, now some of the barriers to getting into the labor market go, but when you get there, you find that also the protections that workers enjoy, the rights they enjoy in the labor market have been weakened. And the central dynamic of this process is one that uh, is one of educating more women, drawing more women into paid employment, but exerting downward pressure on the returns to paid employment for both men and women. So for instance, we can, in some countries where there's data you can show, you can have a narrowing of, uh, say, the gender wage gap because men's wages fall and women's wages fall too, but they don't fall quite as much as men's wages. So you've got a kind of equalizing down rather than an equalizing up. <laughs> uh, one of the, the kinds of uh, conclusions that the, the, the IMF economists draw, well, reducing gender inequality by leveling the economic playing field between men and women could also go a long way to reducing overall inequality of the income distribution. Um, if we're a bit cynical, we may say, yes, you see, having more women in the labor market is not only going to be good for growth, it's going to be good for uh, economic uh, equality as well. But just like the OECD study, they do not pay any attention uh, uh, to the possibility of an increase in the total working day uh, for women and the work intensity of low and middle income women. And they call for investment to free up women's time for work outside the house in a, a series of uh, services that we and, and, and uh, forms of social protection that we probably all agree with. But what they don't consider is whether um, IMF policies that constrain fiscal space are going to make this impossible. So on the one hand, we've got to people who've actually done this piece of research saying countries should be investing in all these good things that will reduce uh, gender inequality. But on the other hand, we've got the economists who negotiate the loans and the conditions for the loans uh, doing so in ways that constrain the fiscal space that governments have. So that leveling of the economic playing field isn't just down to what individual governments want to do, it's down to what kind of fiscal space are they allowed by organizations like the IMF. Let me now turn uh, to what a um, couple of uh, heterodox uh, studies uh, have to say about gender inequality and economic inequality. And these are studies that look at the functional distribution of income. So the one by Finoff and Dyadev examined the relationship between female share of the labor force and the share of labor in national income for OECD countries at quite a long time period. 
And in this time period, the female share of the labor force has been rising, while the labor share of national income has been falling. So they included the female share of the labor force as an explanatory variable uh, alongside a lot of other things that are listed uh, up there, which are well, the kinds of things people put in their regression equations when they're trying to understand what's driving uh, this uh, decrease in the labor share of income. Their innovation was to add for the first time female share of the labor force into this kind of analysis. And what they found, what, the, what their regression results uh, showed them was that a larger female share of the labor force is significantly negatively linked with the labor share of national income. They try different specifications of their equations, but um, they found that a 1% rise in the female share of the labor force was associated with a 0.2% to 0.6% decline in labor share of national income. So this is saying all good things don't go together. <laughs> we might be having a re the, uh, th that uh, as um, uh, gender inequality in terms of share of the labor force uh, reduces, class inequality in terms of labor share of national income goes up. And one underlying mechanism for that could be the substitution of female for male workers, because female workers are cheaper and less organized. But again, because of the persistence of occupational segregation, you do not see uh, many cases of direct substitution. And again, I would be, and indeed, um, Finoff and Dyer have also noted that a more complex um, explanatory framework would refer to the erosion of stable employment, the expansion of flexible specialization, the increase in male unemployment in many OECD countries, and increased female participation in the labor forces as concurrent and linked processes. So it may not be that women entering to the labor market is acting to reduce men's wages. It may be that pressures that have reduced men's employment and men's wages have pushed women into the labor market in order to try and maintain family incomes. So uh, Finoff and Diadef are careful to state there isn't an inherent and irreducible conflict between greater female participation in paid work and positive outcomes for workers. And they conclude that eliminating discrimination against women can, as they put it, serve to strengthen labor as well as women. But I'd argue if we simply look at discrimination in, in, in the uh, labor market, eliminating that in a narrow sense won't be enough. Uh, you need to address the way that the process of social reproduction is organized and articulated with the process of production. And this needs to be restructured in various ways so that both men and women can easily combine getting a living and taking care of family, neighbor, and friends. So it's not a reduction of discrimination against women in a narrow sense that's, that's needed, but that's not going to be enough. You've got to have policies that will address unpaid work, that will reduce the amount of unpaid work that has to be done through investment in public services, and will redistribute the remaining unpaid work so it's more equally distributed between men and women. And for that, the kind of levers you have for that is uh, things in the, in the social security system, like um, paid parental leave for fathers as well as mothers. And I've just got a piece coming out about that in an American um, labor studies journal called New Labor Forum. So research is currently underway uh, at Greenwich, uh, Political Economy Research Centre, by Alexander Goshensky and Ursula Manarin, and they very kindly shared that with me. They're looking at 15 OECD countries, and they're looking at the determinants of wage share by industry. So their innovation is to disaggregate the economies into different industrial sectors and to look at the capital and labor share by sector, not uh, just by the uh, 
share of national income, and also disaggregating uh, by low, medium, and high-skilled workers. That's important because we actually know there's huge inequality in uh, wage income. It's not just an inequality between capital income and labor income. There's huge inequalities among um, uh, workers, people who get paid a wage and salary. Um, the measure of the wage share is the ratio of labor compensation to value added, and they find that it decreased in 70% of the sectors in these 15 countries, they exclude the public sector, they exclude mining and agriculture, but they include manufacturing, utilities and services. So the wage share is going down across um, the majority of sectors. And they're looking, again, they're setting up an equation, a regression analysis to see what factors might be explaining this. And their innovation, I think, another innovation is to add uh, the female employment share in the sector to look uh, as among the potential explanatory variables, as well as union density, the extent to which um, uh, people working in the sector belong to a trade union, uh, different measures of globalization and different measures of technological change. And another important innovation is they measure female employment as share of hours worked by women to total hours worked in the sector. So that allows for the fact that a lot of women are working part time. If you just take female labor share, uh, share of the labor force and you don't adjust it, you're actually overestimating the extent to which uh, women are uh, uh, employed in production in the sector. Their findings, a little bit different to uh, the earlier story, uh, uh, study, the pioneering study I referred to. Overall, they find there's a very small statistically, a small statistically significant negative association of female share of employment and labor share of value added by sector. But this is driven by the female share of low skilled employment. So if you disaggregate then the shares of the low skilled, the medium and the high skilled workers, the estimations for uh, medium skilled and high skill uh, employment, the, sh the labor shares of medium and high skilled workers didn't find a, statistical, a statistically significant relationship with the share of women in the hours worked in medium skill and high skill employment. What's driving this um, negative association is the um, experience of uh, low-skilled workers. And a possible explanation for this is that there is a greater gender differences in the pay of low-skilled workers than medium and high-skilled workers. So it's this um, uh, low-skilled, uh, it's in low-skilled work where we've got that association of the reduction of gender inequality with an increase in class inequality. And that is, if you like, is because it's easier to exploit low-skilled women than, it's easier than it is to exploit low-skilled men. Because it's easy to exploit both of them than it is the higher-skilled workers, but um, the low-skilled women, it would seem at a particular disadvantage. So in terms of the policy implications they point to, uh, uh, Grzynski and Anarum call for a strengthening of the bargaining power of labor, as many do, but not only by improvements in union rights and in minimum wages. Minimum wages are very, very important for gender equality as well as class equality, but also for increasing the social wage via public goods and social security. And I think this bringing in the idea of the social wage is really important. And implicit in this reference to the social wage is a recognition that the articulation of capital accumulation and social reproduction is mediated by the state that can take action to reduce and redistribute unpaid work or fail to take action uh, and to reduce the role of the wage in social reproduction, so more of the resources that you need for social reproduction come through a non-wage form. And this implies that the dynamic of bargaining and rights that we're interested in isn't just between capital and labor in the workplace, 
it's between capital and labor uh, in a way that brings in uh, the arena of the state as well and the kinds of public services and social protection, the fiscal circuits as well as the um, circuits of um, uh, production and of distribution. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to them for sharing those early results with me and I'm in an ongoing discussion with them as they refine their work. Do I have five minutes? Okay. okay, so let me end by just saying a couple of things about what is, you know, the best-selling book on uh, inequality, class inequality uh, ever. Um, and this, of course, focuses if you like, on the share of capital in national income rather than the share of labour in national income. No econometric analysis, lots of charts and stories. And I think this goes some way to explaining why this has been a bestseller. <laughs> Lessons there for the rest of us, I think. Um, so I just want to pick out the part of Piketty's analysis where he, he so what's driving this increase in the share of uh, capital? He doesn't try and set up some regression equation. He says, going to look at this in terms of two things, the rate of return on what he calls capital, which in itself is problematic, and the rate of growth of output. And it's kind of inevitably the case, it's just an accounting identity, that if the rate of return of capital is greater than the rate of growth of output, then the share of capital in output or income will increase. So what really matters is what's driving R and what's driving G. And um, Piketty tends to argue that, I mean, he just rather plucks, in my view, out of the air, the idea that R tends to persist on average at between 4 and 5%, except when there's an exogenous shock like war or revolution. Uh, and G <laughs> depends on productivity and population increases, both of which are treated as exogenous, and both of which are now falling. I was particularly struck when he said decreased growth, especially demographic growth, is thus responsible for capital's comeback. That struck a dagger to my heart because I actually um, some of the things that underlie demographic growth have been very, very critical for um, improving the well-being of women and reducing gender inequality. If you don't have to spend all your life having uh, lots of children and taking care of them, that's one of the things that's really underpinned uh, the improvement in the well-being of a lot of women around the world. So I don't like the idea that demographic, the, the end, um, decreased demographic growth is responsible for capital's comeback. There must be more to it than that. Um, well, a lot, a lot of heterodox critiques of Piketty have challenged these exogeneity assumptions he makes about R and about G. And feminists, I just point to the ones that feminist economists have particularly made. Uh, first, the critique of the, end of, uh, of, the, of the assumption that fertility and the labor supply are exogenous. So the argument has been, no, they're not, they're endogenous. Fertility decisions are not simply private individual choices uh, determined by, quote, cultural factors. They depend on gendered institutions, like women's access to public services. And um, Diane Perrins has pointed out that it's the European countries with better publicly provided childcare services and thus less requirement for unpaid work, which have got higher fertility. That those fertility decisions are endogenous to what's happening to the social wage. Similarly, Jayati Ghosh, who I know is a familiar, frequent visitor to SOAS, has pointed out that capitalism has always generated a supply of labor to adjust to demand, including through changing the labor force participation of women. So we shouldn't see these, quote, demographic changes as exogenous changes, I think, but endogenous changes. Similarly, the rate of return on capital we shouldn't see as some exogenous, uh, exogenously determined thing that every now and then there's a shock uh, that uh, reduces it, but then it bounces back up. Um, underpinning the rate of return on capital are, yes, processes of production, which a surplus is extracted, 
which heterodox economists emphasize, though Piketty does not, but also processes of social reproduction uh, in which the costs of social reproduction are externalized to non-value spheres of households and states. And this task of turning the historically and socially determined wage into the means for reproduction of this and future generations is, is one that falls primarily, not exclusively, but primarily to women. Well, the more you can externalize these costs of social reproduction, the higher other things being equal uh, can be the rate of return on capital. But other things are not equal because households are not equipped to supply the kinds of education and health services and risk mitigation needed to produce the kinds of labor that industrialized production requires, which is why we, have, we see the growth of the social wage, which is why we see the growth of uh, public investment and public services and, and social protection systems. So I think there's an ongoing tension between externalizing the costs of social reproduction as a way of increasing the rate of return on capital and um, needing a kind of investment in public services to produce the particular kinds of labor force that a more industrialized, more technologically complex economy needs. And this underlies the determination of R as well. There's an ongoing tension there. And in that, that ongoing tension creates a space uh, that means that social reproduction, no less than production, is, is a bargained process. And it's a site of struggle. So I think uh, feminist analysis would suggest if we're thinking about the relation between R and G, it's shaped by the outcome not only of struggles on wages and conditions of paid work, but also on conditions um, of social reproduction. In particular, that's critical for um, uh, thinking about how uh, the fiscal circuits and the issue of the taxation uh, uh, or lack of taxation um, of uh, uh, capital. So let me end by saying that uh, what I've been trying to argue is that economic inequality and gender inequality are intrinsically intertwined and we can't fully understand economic inequality without taking into account the gendered character of economies. We must guard against uh, reductions in inter-household income inequality being achieved at the cost of increasing the total working day and intensity of work of many women. So I don't want to see added to the burden of women, work more and we'll have faster economic growth. Adding to that, work more and we'll have uh, less inequality between households without thinking about, is it just more and more work for women? Or what do we have to do uh, to reduce the amount of unpaid work? And finally, that reversing increases in economic inequality between capital and labor requires policies and struggles that reshape both the process of production and of social reproduction, both paid labor and unpaid. Mm-hmm.
the wider political or discursive limitations of this way of thinking. I think you can hear me, yes? Um, of, of, um, of asking the question about, um, about uh, what it is that we want to know about the relationship between gender equality and the, and the wider uh, economic inequality. Um, the sec my second reflection relates very much to, to where you end up um, in terms of uh, the importance of taking seriously um, the role uh, and the place of social reproduction uh, and the work of care and the unpaid work of, of caring, um, caring relations. Um, and you talk, I'm not sure if it was on the slides that you went through, but I, um, the slides that I read, uh, you talk about the need to recognize, redistribute, and reduce that, that, that unpaid uh, um, work of care and, and social reproduction. Um, and certainly in the, in the wonderful article you wrote for Feminist Reviews, special issue on the politics of austerity, um, that was a very important part uh, of your overall argument. So I, I, I would like to um, hear more about um, what that might look like um, and, and what that entails. Um, I'll just say my very last point in, in um, the work that, that I've been doing most recently in looking at um, social policy across a wide range of social policies um, to do um, uh, that, that uh, to do with social security, with migration, with um, benefit systems and uh, family policy uh, during the period, during, in the context of austerity, um, reproduction, the work of reproduction comes up time and time and again in policy documentation and in policy discourses as the thing that can't be born, that is just too expensive, too much of a burden on the state, and becomes an argument for why we need the austere state. So I think that that, um, that argument that you're making, that, this need, that the social reproductive needs to be revalued, um, is tremendously um, important in the current context. And I'm just going to stop there. Thank you. respond straight away or should we go to some questions um I'll, I'll just say thank thank you i think those are really good points and i i just um on on challenging the privileges of some uh reducing inequality means challenging the privileges of some i agree but i think we also got the issue of challenging the privileges of some in ways that might help us build coalitions. So I think this is particularly important when we're looking at the intersection of gender inequality uh, with class and race inequality. So it's, can we find a way of challenging the privileges of the white men, which I know is a big issue for you here in SOAS, <laughs> um, but in ways that help us um, build necessary coalitions that we're, we're going to need uh, uh, to build um, uh, uh, that will stretch across different kinds of inequalities. But, mm. So I, I, I agree with you, but I th and that's why I think, that's why I wanted to look at the heterodox economists who are trying to bring in um, uh, gender as a variable in their analysis, their quantitative analysis of what might explain the um, declining share of labor, because that poses quite starkly the issue of what about, can, can we, is it possible to have a, a class uh, alliances that take into account other kinds of inequalities mm -hmm. when, when all kinds of inequalities might not be diminishing at the same time? Some might be going up, some might be going down. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to questions. I'm going to take three at a time. Ali? My question is, um, yeah, sorry. Um, I guess my question relates to uh, uh, the type of policies on the basis of what we can imagine, which is where you left it, 
especially if we try to address the articulated action and social interaction. Some of the studies, uh, well, the heterodox studies that you mentioned, they point more at strengthening the bargaining power of labor, the classic production targeted interventions. Once we try to imagine instead the measures that uh, try to reach out for social reproduction, what is it that we talk about? And for instance, with all the debates we have on basic income at the moment, which uh, actually was one of the early, I mean, it's an avatar, but was one of the feminist the demands in the 70s with the wages for household campaign. I wonder if there's something to be said there or to, to be brought back to the attention um, of uh, social policy makers. Thank you for that. I thought the presentation was fascinating. I in different parts of the presentation were all equally fascinating, absolutely beautiful in the um, conclusion. Um, in the first part of your um, discussion, uh, it seemed to me that the focus was on uh, the impact of women's entry into the labor market on inequality between males and females and in society as a whole. Now, then you reported that the literature coming from the mainstream and coming from the heterodox, it seemed to me that that literature was located at slightly different planes. The mainstream talking about the dynamics of capitalism in general, and the heterodoxy talking about the dynamics of neoliberalism and recent changes in the structure of the uh, economy uh, in recent decades. Now, First question is, does this represent adequately or this, these uh, debates? But also, is it possible to draw a parallel between those debates uh, with the problem of immigration? In the past, under Keynesianism and now, is there a similar impact in the labor market and inequalities? But also, if you can go back and look at the dynamics of capitalism in general, how about the withdrawal of children from the labor market and what was the impact of that on social equality? One more, yeah. Long, it's called cross sectional and time series. questions. Um, basic income, which I would say is actually rather different from wages for housework. I think basic income is a really interesting, um, there's a really interesting discussion going on about basic income as a way of, uh, of um, it, it, as a kind of um, social protection, social security system that might help deal with uh, some of the, the extreme inequalities. Um, uh, that's fine so long as it's base, the focus on basic income is not seen as an alternative to improvements uh, in, in, the, labor, in the, the labor market. So I think you need to be both. You need to be working both on improvements in social security through 
what the state redistributes, as well as the direct improvement in in bargaining rights and things like minimum wages. So you can, it's not either basic income or minimum wages. You going to need definitely need both. Although then the challenge is basic income to be meaningful is going to require a lot of tax revenue. And um, what you were saying, you know, about the, the challenges with austerity policies and the, the challenges of uh, raising um, tax revenue um, is, is, is something which is, yeah, that I think that I see that as the, the basic problem, really, in trying to make have a, a meaningful basic income, which means it has to be a high enough level to replace a lot of the fragmented and punitive um, uh, elements of welfare states that we have at the moment is can we raise enough taxes to do that? And um, the, 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 uh, uh, that's a huge challenge. And that for that, we need to, to definitely have these kind of broad coalitions of forces um, because it's a big, difficult challenge. Uh, which cannot be solved by women, cannot be solved by trade unions, cannot be solved by black and ethnic minority people on their own. I think that's one of the reasons why you have to have some coalitions. Sorry. But really fascinating to the issue of immigration. Um, um, and so two issues. One, of course, um, getting the data is more difficult, but um, you you could certainly, I'm, I, as other people maybe know more about whether there have been any studies that have looked at labor share of income and uh, used as one of the explanatory variables uh, the share of the labor force that are migrants. I could imagine if the data is available, one could do that. And one might probably find, yes, as the share of migrants goes up, has gone up, the share in some countries, the share of uh, labor has gone down. But just as with the um, share of women going up and the share of labor going down, you have to be very careful not to say one causes the other. Similarly, with the share of migrant labor going up and the share of labor going down, you have to look at the, the complex forces that are propelling people uh, to migrate um, uh, and, and that are like on both the supply side and the demand side of this. But I, th I think that's an interesting issue. Um, so maybe this is a good PhD topic for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and um, <coughs> the withdrawal of children from the labor market, I, I think that, that was interesting. That was a big, as a result really of a massive mobilizations where it happened. Uh, to mean that, if you like, less time of the working classes was mobilized for capitalist production. It was part of the struggle about not only the length of the working day, but how much time um, of, a, of a households was devoted to capitalist production. Um, and I, I have no idea what that might have done in terms of the, the inequalities. It went along, of course, with a lot of other changes that might outweigh the impact of loss of household income because technologies change so that other members of the household might uh, earn more money. Male breadwinners uh, got to earn more money, maybe, when that happened. Um, and in terms of, um, I think the the the. Uh, of course, the OECD and the IMF studies are not framed in terms of uh, any, any uh, the kind of critique of neoliberalism that the heterodox studies would be uh, concerned with, but um, they are covering similar time periods, and they are looking, they are taking into account similar factors like increase in uh, financial mobility and trade openness, just that the the way they would frame the issues uh, is different. And they, um, I, I think, um, and that the, the, the um, question that you raised about the OECD and the IMF studies about convincing politicians to try and reduce gender inequality. 
I, I think this is a second string to the bow. There have been a huge number of studies on economic growth and gender inequality and how if you want your economy to grow faster, you should reduce gender inequality. Um, well, as we all know, politicians don't always pay attention to the evidence of the experts. So there's, there's a limit to what you're going to get from that. But there is a, a lot of it. So I think this is a second string to the bow. OK. People are starting to get a bit more worried about inequality. Mainstream politicians, CEOs of big companies are starting to get a bit worried about inequality. Um, uh, uh, system stabilization is obviously one of the concerns they have, and quite rightly, I think, from, from their point of view. Uh, and I think it's in that framework. It's the OECD is already, and the IMF starting to do work on inequality, which it didn't do before. And then within that, oh, well, maybe we should look at uh, gender inequality as well. And we should see not only what's happened to gender inequality alongside what's happened um, to inequality between households, uh, but maybe we should try and have to look and see how they intersect. And that's what the interesting thing was. And it's not that I have a quarrel with their um, policy advice on yes should invest more in childcare and things like that yeah they should uh, but the problem is that the other kinds of advice that the imf and the oecd gives as institutions is still along neoliberal lines and it's not going to make it possible for governments to follow the advice on what public services they should uh, invest in in order to reduce gender inequality or gentlemen here Mm. Where, uh, you know, the advocacy you have two, you know, not different poles, but different, you're stressing different parameters. Yeah. Right? One, and the need to look at things from a justice, human rights perspective. Yeah. And I'm not saying you're doing this, but just saying that, well, in order to get your message across, some element of your representation of women, quality, and environment. Do think that, that these are uh, issues of historical struggle, because we have we saw a period where um, some kinds there was quite a lot of reduction of inequality at a time when actually growth was high and and a lot of and countries were being decolonized and and uh, and um, uh, a, a struggle for their independence. So if we think of the kind of uh, 50s and 60s and 70s, there was a time when the forms of capitalism we had then seemed to be, it seemed to be quite compatible with the process of capital accumulation to have reductions of some kinds of inequalities. So I don't think it's kind of something you can read off from some kind of logic of capital accumulation, but I think it's important to look for the the, the contradictions in the process, which mean there's a chance of some kind of struggle uh, for rights and for inequality getting some kind of um, uh, toehold, getting some kind of traction, because the system of capitalist accumulation itself is a contradictory system. So I tried to give one example. On the one hand, it likes to external, it will reduce its cost by externalizing the cost of social reproduction. But on the other hand, um, that kind of externalization is not successful in, produ in, in producing the kinds of labor force that a more com technologically complex industrialized economy needs. And so you have a space there in which um, working class and national liberation forces and so forth were and women's organizations were able to uh, through their different struggles to to um, sometimes separately sometimes together uh, uh, get in 
investment, get some investment in public services, get some investment in social protection systems. Now, in many countries, those things are under attack again, and perhaps here in Europe, because they're particularly under attack here, we, we definitely have that in the forefront of our minds. Um, go to Uruguay, and maybe anybody here from Uruguay? Things might look a little bit different. They're not being the same kind of um, downward pressure on um, uh, over, over the last 10 years, on, and there's rather been an expansion of, um, of uh, uh, rights and of uh, services and of uh, uh, equality. So I, I think it, does, it, is, it is contingent on, on the nature of particular struggles. And I think, um, and I think it is important to think about both recognizing the specificity of different kinds of inequality and different kinds of oppression, but also trying to build coalitions across those intersections because uh, what we're up against is very powerful. Uh, and uh, I think we're all looking around for seeing you know, where can we find those possibilities? Where can we find those possibilities? So I find, for instance, in the movement on tax justice, international movement on tax justice, um, uh, quite an interesting um, example of coalition building of a kind which I think is very important. The, yeah, the lady here. Gentleman just behind you. Interesting questions. On grandparents, I haven't done any um, academic research on this. I just know <laughs> the personal experience as a grandparent. But um, but of course, the um, inequalities across uh, age groups is also an important uh, axis of, of inequality. 
uh, to have a look at. Um, and um, uh, there is, in all countries, a lot of um, uh, uh, unpaid uh, work in families is done by grandparents, especially grandmothers. Um, and it's important to recognize that, and it's important to think, for instance, in countries where they're going to raise the retirement age, so people have got to work longer in paid work in order to get their pension. What does that mean in terms of um, uh, uh, unpaid unpaid uh, childcare that grandparents have been providing? There, there's quite there's an organisation in the UK, certainly, of grandparents that, that looks at these kinds of issues in some detail, and there may be in some other countries as well. But sometimes it's just taken for granted. This is what grandparents do. But you can see in countries, anybody, China, then countries like China, with the huge demographic changes, where the, 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 at the moment there's a problem in looking after the grandparents when they get really frail and elderly, but this next generation down, there aren't going to be that many grandparents either. So um, those, those demographic changes across the age ranges are, are important to look at. Um, I uh, I agree with you that actually what 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 capitalism is interested in is its rate of return. Sometimes faster economic growth is a is a way to that improving that rate of return. Sometimes it's not. Um, uh, uh, it's more I think that that analysis that uh, focusing economic analysis on what will improve the rate of growth is something that's been actually directed more to politicians than to capitalists per se on the grounds that if you increase the size of the pie you can satisfy more of your voters uh, uh, and I, 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 but I, I think now you can see there's a bit of a worry about maybe inequality has gone too far uh, on the part of uh, some um, capitalist companies. Um, so maybe um, that's why we all drink our champagne and eat our caviar at Davos, and we listen to Winnie Bionema from Oxfam, who gives us the latest data on international inequality. And we say, this is terrible. We don't want riots in the streets. Um, but you're saying we should pay more taxes? Oh, oh. Uh, so I think there's some interesting tensions there at the moment in terms of has inequality become too extreme, the 1%? And is this undermining, therefore, the the conditions for the social reproduction of profitability. Mm. Maybe, maybe not, but I think there's, there's, there's some spaces there that we can work in. And in terms of the current conjuncture, the particular circumstances we face now with rhetorics from the right about women's rights and minority rights and so forth being that's just the talk of the global elite. As I know, the working class has two sexes and several, <laughs> several genders and several uh, races. And I think we really have to resist um, that. Um, I saw a nice article recently, I think maybe it's in The Guardian, called um, Populist Correctness. What we have to resist is populist correctness, which says all of the concerns about inequality and rights is just liberal metropolitan. And no, it isn't. There are people out there at the grassroots struggling about all of these rights. And we really have to resist the claiming that low-income people are not interested uh, in inequality and rights. They are. They are. And you, I mean, there's huge, you look in the US now, the resist, anybody here from the US? Resistance, yeah, the resistance against against the Trump administration from lots and lots of low-income people, organised in community groups, organised in um, in trade unions, but also organised in, in women's groups, um, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and so forth. But you're right, there's a rhetoric that we really have to resist about these concerns about rights and inequalities. Uh, uh, it, there's just you. It's just you, privileged students in SOAS. 
who were uh, talking about these kinds of things. Real people aren't interested in these. I think we really have to resist them. We have time for one final round of questions. Uh, Steve? I think it's really important that um, there's investment in vocational skills and in engineering in all countries, but as part of that, as part of that investment, there has to be a training of engineers about their interface with people. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, so often engineers think about we're building something. We're building, well, people are bound to, you know, they're bound to come and use it. They don't think about the interface enough with people and the design of the um, facilities with people. I talked in Morocco, they made a, a pressure from women's organizations and with some sympathetic officials. They wanted to get the government to think about all its public expenditure in terms of what was its gender equality implications. When the people in education and health could see that much more quickly. And in infrastructure building, this is dominated by the engineers. But we don't deal with people. We deal with you know, building roads and water pipes and so forth. And so to get them to think about, yes, but if this is going to improve productivity or improve people's well-being, you've got to think about how are people using this? And is it best designed to meet the needs of people and maybe different people have different needs in the way that they use roads or water systems and maybe you should take that into account was a kind of oh <laughs> so I do think there's a challenge there so I think the gender issues in engineering go beyond we should have more women engineers yeah we should have more women engineers uh, but we should go beyond that we should be thinking about how do we Brain engineers in ways that they can uh, interact more and think more about the, the people that whatever they're designing and building is meant to serve. Uh, and then they would be better engineers. Any final questions? Okay, so uh, I'm going to thank Diane, firstly, for her wonderful contribution, and also our um, discussant, Irene, so can we give them both a round of applause?